just, I got a note from Vanessa that's, that because of her and, and everyone's hard work, we've got so far 23 member organizations and over 60 individual members applied to the Open Source Robotics Alliance in just wow. a few weeks. Wow. Which is, it's crazy. Hello, ROS developers, and welcome to the ROS Developers Podcast, the program, the podcast that gives you insights from the experts about how to program your robots with ROS. This is Ricardo from The Construct, and today I would like to dedicate this episode to all those ROS developers over there that are thinking and worrying about the future of ROS. So is it go ROS going to be relevant in the future? Are all any of those companies building humanoid robots over the world going to take the space of ROS? We don't know. We don't know. And we are not going to know the answer in this episode anyway. But if you keep listening, maybe you will get some information for your own deductions. And of course, if you keep following the ROS Developers Podcast, then you will know this information in the close future. Then in any case, this episode is dedicated to you. Now, we are going to start with the uh, meat of the episode. But before that, let me go just very quickly to tell you about the Botbox Warehouse Lab that we at The Construct, we have launched recently. This is uh, what we call is a classroom robot kit for teaching in a box. So it's basically is a space. We provide this box that contains three robots, then some panels, also the floor, some cubes, and all those are connected so you can make your students practice with all this setup. It's a very, very simple setup to construct by using our box. So in just a few minutes, you can have your robot running and then your students engage. The good thing about this Botbox Warehouse Lab is that it also includes the learning material and the projects for your students. So you can use this to teach your students, also to evaluate your students and assign to them some practices on the real robot scenario. So I will put the link to the description of this project, of this Botbox Warehouse Lab, just in case that you are interested. And yeah, so you can go and buy one set over there. So that's for the uh, advertising, advertisement uh, phase of the podcast. Now let's go to the meat, yes? The, the thing that you are waiting for, really. So the, the thing of today is a very, very interesting topic and has caused some sensation over the Ross world because today we are going to talk about the Open Source Robotics Alliance. Hey, what is that? Then we are going to know because today we, have, we are going to interview Ryan Gariepi, who is the CTO of ClearPath Robotics and Auto Motors. But... Ryan also is the co-chair of the Canadian Robotics Council and is, of course, is the part of the board of directors of Open Robotics. So Ryan is going to be clarifying for us all the doubts that we have about what is the Open Source Robotics Alliance. Welcome to the podcast, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Ricardo. I think this was my... It's my second time on the podcast, and I think the first time it was episode two. Yes, you are right. Yes, so you remember. And it was our second episode, and it was troublesome. So <laughs> I remember that we had some problems at the beginning of the podcast. So this beginning of the podcast part is, is missing. In the, you, you can go and check for the episode of episode two also, and you will see that. But that's my pleasure to have you here again, and also for this such important subject. Excellent. And just for the audience that they don't know, but they like these kind of things. So we also have some problems at the beginning of this episode, <laughs> right? <laughs> Small. But now we are better prepared so we can uh, detect that and, and restart again. So 
no problem. Nothing's missing. Right? Right. Fix it in post. <laughs> Excellent. Then, yeah, so my first question related to the Open Source Robotics Alliance is what it is. <laughs> of course. Yeah, just, no, it's a, it's a great place to start. Really, the, the Open Source Robotics Alliance is a, what's called the charitable program of the Open Source Robotics Foundation. So it's still part of the OSRF, but it's it's a way to put some structured governance behind the some of the major parts of the OSRF that everyone really depends on, right? Like Roscon and things like that are are very important to the global robotics community, but you know. If, it, if Roscon is in one city versus another, it doesn't change anyone, doesn't hurt anyone. Whereas if Ros doesn't build or if there's quality problems or if we're not building the right thing, it's very, it's very important. So we're trying to extend the work that was done originally with the, the Ros 2 TSC and, and take that towards a, a more expanded structure and also a structure that is that has a, a more positive, a more a structured, uh, a more positive balance between, you know, corporate contributions as well as 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 the pure uh, meritocratic approach. Sorry, I think okay. I pronounced that wrong. I write it a lot, but I don't read it out that much. Um, but really, is to find that balance between between the corporate contributions that we need and and the influence that some of these that large companies like to have in these areas, as well as making sure that fundamentally it remains like the meat of what Ross is or what Gazebo is, is still down to individual contributors, no matter where they work, no matter who pays them, no matter where they live. So, so can I summarize all these like uh, an organization, let's say, I mean, the term organization means everything. So, so a way of organizing people, that's the, yes. only this, not the legal term, is a way of organizing people in order to to govern how ROS and related projects are going to be developed in the future. Yeah, it really, that's, that's a good way to look at it. It's also a way to continue to democratize the work that's in the, the global, that's being done by the global robotics community. Um, I don't know um, how many, how many of your, your viewers remember the days when, the core ROS contributions, I don't, I'm not counting random drivers and random algorithms, but core ROS contributions were entirely done by Willow Garage and just entirely paid for by Willow Garage. And then some, some other companies such as like, you know, ClearPath Robotics, we were one of the first external companies to gain, you know, committer rights or maintain, I think it was maintainer rights to Roscom, for example. And you've got a number of other companies start to get involved more and more, but we're, we're trying to keep that going, right? As more companies as more companies contribute to ROS, we need to make sure, and, and more individuals contribute to ROS and more research organizations contribute to ROS, we need to make sure that we have a good structure to, to guide these contributions. And it also needs to, to grow. For example, a lot like if, for those of you who are familiar with the ROS2 TSC, it got very quickly into topics which were not to, which had nothing to do with ROS2. Like, like for example? Like, there was there was all sorts of discussions. Uh, there was all sorts of discussions around testing, for example, more generally, uh, okay. or, or benchmarking, or community, or what have you. And and that was important. People have these. People are bringing up these these topics for a very good reason. But the ROS two structure, the ROS two TSC structure, was not was not structured to to handle this structure. I see. Or then you've got questions about gazebo. Like you're, this is ROS two. Like it's it's intentionally. There's nobody really from gazebo like who's contributing to Gazebo in it, but yet it was coming up. There was a need from the community. And at, at the same time, it's also important to separate out what's called the management topics, like priorities or standards or, or anything like that from technical topics, like the actual architecture. And that's, uh, that's also something that this, that this new, uh, this new alliance handles. Manages. Managers in this way. Okay, so um, okay, that's very complex. Okay, so then for you, yeah, for you is very clear because you have been involved in the creation of this alliance. But 
for us, the, the people that just receive the information now. It's a little bit. So let me try to speak for, for the audience that doesn't know. Then, this by, by asking you questions, then, yeah. uh, then this alliance includes the people that decide the direction of ROS and also the people that develops ROS. Let's say ROS as in, in general, okay? So it, I include inside ROS the ROS itself, the gazebo, open RMF, infrastructure, all this. So the alliance will be the people that decide in which direction those projects go and the developers that do that. Is that right? Well, I think I think your your thought of let's you know let's simplify away the legal discussions and the governance discussions is is a good way to go. So, in the end, you've got the people who who use ROS primarily. You just you use it. You've got the people who write code for ROS. You've got the people who implicitly or explicitly set priorities on well, not just ROS. So so robotics like the ROS, ROS suite, we call it. Yes. So okay. the people who write code for the people who use the ROS suite, the people who write code for the ROS suite, the people who are setting higher level priorities and directions about the ROS suite, like how much should it be tested? Should it, should it start targeting, you know, should it, should it target, you know, robot or prioritize robots for nuclear power plants more than it prioritizes robots for hobbyists, right? Like the set, the setting of the priority. And then finally you have the overall governance of the ROS suite. And that has always existed, right? Those layers have always existed. It's just that in the middle, it was very complicated. The difference between who sets a priority and who writes code and then like it was complicated and there was no structure for having these conversations. So because of that, some of the conversation, uh, like some of the contributions and, and discussions, they, some of them move too fast and some move too slow. And so what we've done with the alliance is set forth that middle structure where you have members, corporate members of the alliance and, you know, individual members and what have you have an opportunity to speak to that priority level, like the what do we work on and, and at a high level, how do we do it? Like product management almost. Uh -huh. um, and that's really where the alliance sits. Uh -huh. And there's other guidance and what have you, but you still, in the end, In the end, the critical role of contributors, for example, does not go away. But I will note that it also, because of this structure, it also helps answer questions that have always just have this just um, have been rather ad hoc up until this point, because of the rapid and because of the rapid growth of the community, it's it's been ad hoc. Is like how do you get committer rights to you know, to one of the core ROS repositories or the gazebo repositories? Like let's lay that out. Let's make it black and white on how you commit, on how you get those sorts of rights. And that's one of the other things that comes out of this, this overall initiative. Okay. Okay. More or less. I'm getting the picture, more or less. So, so then my second question, that was my first question, okay? But so my second question is, so you kind of answer already, is why do we need one open source robotics alliance And, and, and why now? So you almost kind of answered this question. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, to continue to go into it because that, I think that is a very important question. Why now? And so personally, I'm coming up, excuse me, I'm coming up on 14 years of interacting with and participating in the Ross community, which is, I think, which is up there in terms of experience, or I know it's up there in terms of experience. Yes. Uh, we were the first for-profit, I think, the company, the first company to actually participate in a for-profit way with Ross, right? Yes. And over that time, we've seen a, a, a massive amount of growth in the community. And it really comes down to trying to make sure that it truly does represent as many people and as many of their interests around the world as possible. And what that means is, is we need more structure. Okay, yeah, because of this growth on that speed of growth, all those different directions and without control of any kind. So it's kind of getting... It's, so in the Ross world, maybe we are leading... Without this alliance, we were leading into a bunch of 
small things all around scattered, maybe some destroyed that doesn't work anymore, and, and just a com uh, complete this disorganized system that is going nowhere. The, the other thing is that it's very important that everyone's voices that everyone's voices are heard, and this is a, a substantial improvement in that that manner. But like how does there, the alliance provide this? Well, so so first, I mean, and just just to address the most the most important, or not one of the most important, but a a important item, which is companies who are like who are not funded, you know, by the behest of a of a very charitable billionaire, which is where Will Garage came from. But companies who are all trying to most most ninety five percent of them are trying to make some money off robots. They like to have they like to have some influence in some of these in some of these directions. Okay. And, but at a very high level, like at the priority direction. And I think that's, that's actually very good. If you look on the Ross forums, you see a lot of people saying, and I've, I've seen this in the Ross forums. I've seen this in Hacker News. I've seen this in all sorts of places where it's like, you know, Ross isn't suitable for production. I'm sure you've heard that too. But, yes, you know, many times. I have many millions of hours of operation that says that's not the case, yeah. but this allows the people who actually have strong opinions on where Ross should be better tested or where we should, you know, integrate with other areas to, to actually put their money where their mouth is and support the community, like not just take their own thing and fork it and not have those benefits come back, but, but provide a little bit of influence. And with that, we get a substantial amount of community uh, of impact for everybody. Right. But I think most importantly is that it does have that structure. Like it, it does allow everyone, no matter where you are, where you live, if you've got zero experience with Ross or five years or 10 years or, or whatever, if you've, if you've started Ross from 30 years as a software engineer, or you're just learning it as a high school student, it, it spells out how you get involved in various levels. And I think that's one of the critical areas is that that was up until this point, people have been getting involved and they've been contributing and it's, it's been great. We've had this massive growth. It's, I think it's, surpass the dreams of of everyone of what ross could be but now let's take it to the left the next level let's let's say how do we get you know what's the structure that allows tens of thousands of of users or hundreds of thousands of users to to work more and more with ross okay and what is this structure so let's go to the the point <laughs> to the core yeah, to so it, how do we it. organize yeah so so i mean at your your highest At your highest level, you've got the, the technical governance committee, right? And the technical governance committee, I'm going to try to like not go too far into legals here because nobody wants to hear that. You've got the, the, the governance committee. This is where all like, this is where the, the voting happens. Now it's, but the voting itself, you cannot, like in the end, Ross is an open source initiative. There's no, like, great, a company votes for something. They can't force an open source contributor to do anything. No. But what they can do is they can encourage, they can prioritize, they can say, you know, this is what we collectively believe the coding standard should be, or the testing standard should be, or this is this, this, these are the architectures which we should or should not target. This, this is the sort of thing, the very high level conversations which happened there. Um, and, but at the same time, it's structured so that there's an equal amount of representatives from the projects. So presently, right now, there's four major projects. There's the Ross project, there's Gazebo, there's OpenRMF, and then there's Core Infrastructure. And those are the four major projects. And it's structured so that those, the members of those projects who are all appointed based on skills, not money, not corporations, not affiliations, that they all have an equal representation at this governance committee. Um, And that's, that's at that high level. Again, that comes down to the priorities. That's the one saying, like, here is where all the standards are. Uh, and then it comes down to the, the, the various projects. And each of them sets their own, like, they'll set their own release cadences. They'll have their own charters. Um, you know, obviously, the Ross charter and the Gazebo charter are going to be kind of different. Like, they're not the same thing, right? Yep. Different release cadences, what have you. They'll, and that's where, and, you know, they've got their own set of committers And as before, those are drawn, drawn from the community. And by the community, I mean in the broadest sense of the word. I mean everyone from a volunteer who's never single touched a robot before to, you know, staff engineers who are just entirely paid to work on ROS from like, you know, NVIDIA or auto or what have you, right? Like the community is everybody and they and to participate in those, those 
uh, the, you know, project, project. management, the projects themselves, like at that level to talk about the directions and to be, you know, to merge code, you need to be, you know, technically sound and you cannot buy your way onto one of those committees. And then you've got the, the rest of the community. So those could be people filing like just pull requests of various sorts, bug reports, um, or just users, right? And that, and then that's, that's the structure. Right? And then on top of all that, because the OSRA is a, a program of the OSRF, there is the, there is a, a circuit breaker, so to speak, which is the board of the OSRF and the management of the OSRF. So in the end, you know, the, the management of board is not going to get into the finer details of like discussing, you know, discussing one sentence of an REP versus another, but there is a final check and balance there because the goal or not the goal, the, the legal mandate of the OSRF management and board is, is the support of the open source robotics you know, open source robotics community, open source robotics ecosystem. That's the goal. Okay. There's nothing to a profit there. It's that's the goal. Okay. Um, okay. Great. And then, so if I have correctly understood it, at the end, the open source robotics foundation. Okay. That the the one that created Ross from the beginning. Well, before after Willow Garage area. Yeah. After the Willow Garage area. So. That is on top of the. Oh, is that right? Of the. Uh, sorry, what again? <laughs> of the OSRA. Uh, yes. Yes. Well, exactly. It's a, and that's of the yeah, alliance. It, it, yeah, it, it retains final say. But, and for those people who are curious about the legals of it, or who have read a bit too much into like how the the, the recent open AI debacles about non for profit versus for profit board governance. There's actually not a separate legal entity. The OSRA is, there's not a separate fancy board. The OSRA cannot take like investment or anything like that. It's considered a charitable program of the OSRF. Okay. And that's it. It's actually very, it's from a legal perspective. It's incredibly simple. Okay. Then that is the reason why I'm talking to you, right? Because one of my questions when I try to do this interview with somebody that can answer those questions is, Well, maybe I should ask Vanessa Ormsey, who is the CEO of the Open Source Robotics Foundation. Yeah, and then, but then uh, you redirect. Uh, so, so you, you, the people of Open Robot, Open Source Robotics, then you redirect the, me to you directly. Okay, so that why can you uh, answer those questions so well? Well, I mean. So, I mean, the, like the finer details, I think, I think you emailed like Tully or something like that. Yeah. And then the thing is like Vanessa is, is very busy and there's a lot of stuff that Vanessa can do that I can't. So for example, there, she has a, a huge amount of experience with dealing with, with not-for-profits and charities of all stripes. And she's the one who's out there right now and has done a, a huge job at bringing up, like bringing in contributors and, and new members, which is like, It's, it's just been incredible, the work that she's done. She can do that, and I can't. Yeah, okay. And I can do podcasts. So <laughs> yes, and also because you are the member of the Open Robotics Board. Right. Well, I mean, but she can, she can speak to these. She, she knows every detail that I do, for sure. Um, it's, you know, she's CEO of the Open Source, Open Source Robotics Foundation. Like, exactly. So that, what I was expecting, because I contact Tuli, when he released the news. So I contacted yeah. him directly because he was delivering the news. And then he, I, I told him, who should I speak? And then he redirected me to you because you, you know everything already, also as Vanessa, because you are the member of the uh, board of directors of Open Source Robotics Foundation, right? Yeah, Open well, Source I Robotics. mean, really, it's, it's about sharing the load. It, yeah. A lot of it, it's been a very, very busy time for a lot of us to get this stood up and we still have more deadlines coming up to like release the full list of inaugural members and, you know, release there's, there's conversions. Like we're doing the conversions of all the, of, of all like, you know, technical working groups in the TSC and tr moving forward, like trying to get these answers out for the community or the community as much as, as fast as possible. Like what are committer rights and all these, these other things like, and Vanessa and Jeff are, are really heads down on that one. And, uh, So it's it's really been like ourselves. I think Brian Brian Gerke's done some interviews too. Also. Like it's just been sharing the load these days. Yeah, it's okay. it's been incredibly hectic. And I'll say, and 
I'll say that a lot of people don't appreciate the amount or don't see, I think people would appreciate it, but they don't see the work that people like Vanessa and, and Jeff have put into to standing this up because it's, it's actually been a process. Like this has been for me, one strategic process that started years back and, and the evolution of, of um, divesting the open source robotics corporation to intrinsic and then bringing this up along the way as a more structured governance model, like it's actually, there hasn't been a break actually. So, so some people might've seen this as, Oh, look, it's been sold. Oh. And then we had Roscon. Oh, and now there's this. No, it's actually been like continuous work. And I mean, right now I'm just, I got a note from Vanessa that's that because of her and, and everyone's hard work, we've got so far 23 member organizations and over 60 individual members applied to the open source robotics Alliance in just wow. a few weeks. Wow. Which is, it's crazy. Right. Awesome. That's me. Mean, that means that uh, we have a huge future with Ross then that because the, the community is supporting this. Excellent. Excellent. And I want to say also, I want to uh, bring uh, some support into this idea that you mentioned about, and I am the first one guilty. Okay. First one is we don't see all this hard work that you have been doing on the backstage. And we only see the, like those things, those are spikes that appear uh, some from time to time. And then I do agree with you that this is not fair. So we are doing a judgment that is not fair because we don't see all the hard work that is behind. And then I promise to change my attitude just in front of you and the audience here because it's I, true. It's, it's not fair. It's, it's, it's true. Excellent. I think from my perspective, I, I mean, I appreciate that. And I think from my perspective... I look at the Ross community as, as so many different facets. Like it's important, like we, we pay an inordinate amount of, of attention to, you know, the discourse forums, for example, to make sure that there's like Q and A and, and that's being handled. Um, and it's important to never lose touch with that. And that's why it's, that's why there are structures in place for this. This is why like I'm, you, you can, I think you can publicly check history on like how many read hours I have on discourse. Like I'm on, I usually on every day. Um, but at the same time, it's also important for users of the community to realize that there that some of this stuff, some of this stuff does happen over, you know, over meetings or in person or what have you. And, you know, negotiating like companies with companies for platinum membership support and whatever, like sometimes you just can't you can't talk about it until it's done. And it, it would be great if we could be if everyone could be wide open about that. But for those of you who have, have experience with you know, dealing with, with company budgets and what have you, sometimes it's just thankless. And, um, and I think it's important for every part of the community to not forget that the other parts exist. Um, and then likewise, I think it's also important for both of those groups, like the, both, you know, the corporate members who don't really participate in discourse, but, but use Ross regularly and the people who are, are very, um, very um, dedicated members of the community on the forums or on Stack Exchange but the, both of those groups should also realize that there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who just use Ross on a daily basis and they don't send in pull requests and they, they don't do any of this and they just, they just get frustrated or they, they use it and they love it, like whatever. And I think it's, it's important for all of these groups to realize that the other groups exist. And from the OSRF perspective, it's about balancing the needs of all those groups. And it's, it's, it's tricky. It's, and it's about balancing the communication to all these groups. Like you, you can't communicate the, the same way to everybody. And that's speaking yes. from a lot of, a lot of management experience here. I, I, I understand what you mean and I completely agree with you. Exactly. And also everyone has different needs and also different cultures. So different views of the world, but they are all using draws. That's also uh, difficulty in the jiggling of the of the balls, you know, the, to accommodate this. Yeah, it, and that's why. I mean, I can tell you that that scheduling board of directors meetings is a, a pain um, because we've got people like there's board members or people on the in those meetings in in Asia, in the West Coast of North America, the East Coast, Europe. It's yeah, everybody. Someone's waking up early. You just got to rotate the pain. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't want to know this too much for me, I think. Okay, then let's, let me ask a, a, another question here. Um, so I have here, uh, it's very interesting because I say here, before going into the complex questions, but we already 
went. So, <laughs> so uh, then uh, those questions are been, have been answered. So Ross is not going to disappear as we know it. So it's it's going to be continued in this in the development with this new structure. So let me go to what. So if you can define for the audience, what are the T. GC and the PMCs. What are those? What does do they stand for? Yeah. So the, the TG uh, the TGC is the the Technical Governance Committee, and what it's in charge of is the, like the overall technical activities of of the OSRA. So that's like software quality standards are a very good example. And the other thing that's happening is more more money let's call it unrestricted money is coming in is, is coming in because of these corporate donations and that money will be spent to make Ross better so that the TGC will also make high level decisions on how to allocate some of these funds. So for example, do we, do we beef up our infrastructure? Do we hire, uh, do we hire, um, you know, technical writers on contract? Like that, that sort of, it's again, it's high level, high level structure. Um, you can look at it like, like uh, you know, senior management. Okay. Um, but at the same time, you know, that's not more or less important than the, the PMCs, which are either program management committees or project management committees. Project. I can't exactly remember project. exactly. They're usually, yeah. um, and, um, but they're, they're, it's neither more nor less important than the, the PMCs, which are each in charge of each, pro, each project. So, again, there's the four RAWs, Gazebo, Open RMF, and Infrastructure. They get the shit done. Uh-huh. Uh, to, to put not to put put too fine a point on it, yeah. like they set the charter for what they're doing, right? Like what is the like what should Ross be? What should Gazebo be? Right? They get to set and influence like that again that that high level charter, and um, and then again there's also they get they're the they're expected to know like the fine details, technical details, architectural details. So there may be you know disagreements or code reviews, um, you know code reviews, pull requests, what have you, which. Maybe they're not moved along as fast as they could be. The, they may step in in those areas. Um, the PMCs, you mean? Yeah, the PMCs. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Then uh, the just to summarize, if I have correctly understood, the TGC are the ones that manage the budget and decide to which projects they are going to be uh, assigned the budget, the different parts, and it is. Decide so th this money can be assigned into PMCs, which are projects, and there are yeah. several projects. Uh, at, so far, we have four: the ones that you mentioned before, ROS, uh, OpenRMF, Gazebo, and Infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, right. So, okay, so more or less that would be the the structure, and then the my question is that the people that is Uh, there in those committees, why are they going to uh, deliver their work? So what is the incentive for them to do the, this work? The ones that make the decisions and the other ones that build the projects actually deliver the project. Why? Because if it is your job, as it was so far, even if it was a foundation, it was the, the people was hired there and it was their job to do it. But now is is they are not hired, right? Well, no, but at this, well, they're not hired by the OSRF, but there's more and more companies who rely on Ross. And I think you could ask the same question to so many other groups, like, you know, whether it's drone code to look more at robotics or Linux or Eclipse or the, you know, CNCF or any of those groups like why do people contribute to the linux kernel why do yeah, they, yes. we don't they know we don't know I'm, i'm asking from yeah. ignorant from ignorance sorry from ignorance yeah. well i mean yeah I, i like everyone has their own personal reasons right every organization every individual has their own personal reasons sometimes they just they just want to fix a bug and give back sometimes they're wanting to sometimes they're wanting to uh you know demonstrate their skills right like like contributing to an open source project is a great way to to show that you you know something about ross for example like if you're if you're a, if you're a maintainer of ross core like of the the core of the ross core packages i don't think any company is going to doubt your ability to write 
cross code, you know, speaking at the individual level. Yeah. And at a company level, there's there's plenty of different reasons. And I think we see this to to contribute people directly to open source projects because they use them. And uh, speaking as as someone who does way, way too much uh, engineering management and budgeting on this, like it's it's often easier to stay focused on what you do. Like I um, I have, I don't know what, Auto and ClearPath has 150 engineers of various sorts just building advanced robotics. And we would have had double that sort if we weren't, if we had to rely on Ross, or sorry, if we had to repeat Ross ourselves. Sorry, we rely on Ross entirely, obviously. Um, and that's where these companies get benefits, is especially when you're a larger company. Um, for anyone who's experienced in this, usually if you're saying, you know what, I want to hire, I need to hire some people to work on logging. Like, let's say I want to replace Ross Bag. You can't, you can never hire just one person. Like, you're, you're usually going to wind up with a team because then you need backups, you need code reviews, you need testing, you need sustaining engineering. Like, you, you wind up with these big chunks of work. Um, whereas if you've got an open source project to, lo- to lean on, you don't need to jump to, oh, now I need to maintain a logging, logging project. Now it's like, oh, I just need to fix some bugs here and there, right? So that could be like speaking from the perspective of a, a more established organization, I would rather contribute to Ross here and there um, and then and then continue to focus on what I'm really, really good at and what I can do that nobody else can do. And those contributions, they really add up as I think we've all seen. Yeah. Like yeah. The, the vast majority of, of work that's come into the Ross community as a whole has right not up. been paid for by the OSRF. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why we actually, to, to come down to your point, like why, why now? It's because we saw that transition even two years back where you've got all of these companies around the world contributing great things into Ross, whether it's from individual researchers all the way up to, to mega corporations. And the percentage of work that was actually paid for by the OSRF directly was very much dropping. Right? Okay. Okay. Then if I have correctly understood, then the motivations for this, I see from what you explained there, are, for me, there are three of them. First of one is just people that want to do it because they want. Yeah, because I like, I like to do this kind of engineering things and then I want to do it and that's it. So I did it and I do it and I contribute. Second is people from companies that they are using ROS and then they want to put some effort into developing better ROS because then this will also be better for everyone, including themselves. Right? And third is people that are just hired by this budget. Is that also an, an option? In terms of, like, uh, sorry, who's, whose budget? Uh, the budget of the alliance. So the, yeah, so the alliance, can, the alliance can, hire. can do that sort of move, can, can contract. Yeah, um, exactly. The OSRF actually does retain contractors to make sure the build system is running. That, mm-hmm. that already happens. So that can continue and that can expand. Uh, the OSRF has, you know, obviously some small amount of full-time people too, I believe as a count. Uh, we can hire more if we choose to. So all of those things can be, are, are entirely within the purview of, of how stuff gets done. Okay. Um, okay. Then uh, let me ask another question. So, so we have the paid members of the Alliance. So who can be a paid member of the Alliance? Whoever who pay, who pays. Uh, one moment, my cat. Yes, is your cat is there. I, I can hear the cat, so we can see on the video how the cat okay. wanted to go out, and then Ryan. The kindly... cat cannot be the paid member. So, um, <laughs> so, um, and it, well, really, so is anyone? Anyone can be a paid member. There's various mm-hmm. levels. Um, so there are levels. For example, there's a there's a band and a structure for individual contributors to both you know, contribute to and, and participate in those in those discussions. And we've, we've kind of tiered it. And the other thing that's that's important, I think, in our structure is to try to make it, it's, this, the cost structure is more of a matrix, actually, where you try to make it equitable to take into account that you've got companies like, you know, NVIDIA and AWS and Intel coming to the table and supporting ROS, which is really great. And then you also have startups who are supporting ROS and everyone in between. And we've, we've tried to build a structure that basically, and there's, there's a bunch of details in this structure, which basically says, tries to make sure that a coral, or sorry, 
um, correlates the, the price that you pay to have a, a certain degree of, of membership with the degree that you're investing in robotics. Uh-huh. Um, I see. And to, to make it as, as honestly, as, as fair as possible, because if you're a company, if you're a, start, a small startup and you're willing to pay, you know, if you're willing to pay up, um, you know, 10,000 euros or something like that, that probably means a lot more than a multinational willing to put up 100,000. Yeah. And we've, we've tried to make sure that there's a structure that takes this sort of thing, that, that takes this sort of, this sort of commitment into consideration. Yes, and I have seen this uh, chart that describes the different levels at which uh, each individual can contribute, individual company, whatever, and then based on this, uh, let's say, revenue or size or, I don't know, so the, it's divided into the different prices. So I will put a link on the description yeah. video so people can go there and check and decide if they want to, yeah. to join. We, it. we actually do it based on headcount. So the idea on is... Headcount, yeah is that and it's headcount of like robotics related stuff because a large company that may have a hundred thousand employees but only has 10 people working on robots they do get a bit of a discount okay, right? okay, like you, okay. you do want them at the table um but at the same time and at the same time a a company that's raised a ton of money but has no revenue you're going to pay more because headcount um so really if if we try actually honestly to bias as as far as reasonably possible in favor of the people who are actually willing to commit, you know, like the, the smaller companies, I mean, you can't, you can't tip the scales too far in their direction, but we really tried to say, what are all the corner cases that other people might look at and uh, that, that might look at. And we tried to bias as, as far as possible to making sure that everyone has a, as equal a voice as possible. Excellent. Excellent. So I will put the, the link also. I think I will show it also here on the on the screen some, <laughs> somewhere yeah. over there. So just for some second. Yeah, 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 exactly. So the people can see what we are we are talking about this. Then um, let me see. So so the memberships is the, the money that is paid by those memberships is the one that is the the budget of the alliance. And then it, that is the one that is managed by the TGC. And then it's assigned into the projects, right? The, the PMCs, right? It, it, generally, it, yes. Yeah, it, it, yeah in there's, general. There's probably speaking. some legal nuances. I think like the board can probably override the, the you know, things like that. But um, yeah, but like the general yes. picture. That's, thematically, that's the case. And, it, you know, this comes down to like in the end, everyone can contribute or not contribute. People can choose not to support and. You know, as as a board board of management, we're not going to override if if all of the, if, you know, if all of the TGC says we need to spend money on technical writers, well, we're going to spend money on technical writers. Okay, no. okay, okay. And then by uh, giving this membership, then you get, uh, let's say, a boat in this in this alliance, and then you can I- influence with your boat in which direction that it go- it goes the, the yeah. budget. But I, I do want to continue to, to say, I think I've seen this in the, in various comments online too. I don't want to like over focus on like what the, the votes are. Like the votes are there and they are, they are important for sure, but there are other ways to influence, you know, the direction of the, the community as a whole. Which one? Like, like write code, ah, for okay. example, write documentation, like, you know, put together, you know, compelling Roscon talks. Like, you know, there's all sorts of different ways to, to, to put those sorts of things together. Um, makes sense, makes sense. Okay, very very good to clarify. So then, then um, please uh, um, understand that I am asking from the misunderstanding, okay? Because I have oh, no, read I, the, the I, documentation. New, I, I get it. This is a new journey for the entire community. Yes. Like I think, and I think nobody knows that as, as well as, as myself or, you know, Brian or Jeff or some of the people who've been around since the very beginning, like it's, it's exciting how quickly it's grown. And I actually, there's been all sorts of concerns and comments. And, and to me, that just means that what we're doing collectively matters. Yes, exactly. And that's what it is. <laughs> exactly. So, and also there are new problems, new questions. And when there are new problems and new questions, that means that we are advancing because otherwise we are stuck on the same 
place with the same problems as always, then it means that we are stuck. <laughs> what's the point? Uh, what's the point, exactly. <laughs> okay, let me see. So you have explained also the relation between the alliance and the foundation, the Open Source Robotics Foundation. Um, okay, so, so can you, uh, just to, again, to clarify, be, uh, f to, for the audience, so what would be the typical flow of development under the, this alliance era. So let's say on January, uh, the, the, we decide which project, so the TGC uh, unites and then decides and discusses, and then we assign some budget. So start on February, we start this project. And so can you describe it just to get uh, uh, yeah, a time? We're actually, yeah, we actually don't have, to, we're actually not going to be that structured. Like the okay. only new piece of structure when it comes to calendar timing is that there will be like the elections for project leaders and elected representatives, which happen toward the end of the, the year. And then they're, they're, they're in the calendar year. So the representatives change on a yearly basis. That's the only new structure timing wise. Uh -huh. okay. um, other than that um, calendars, they are just like each group, each, each project is sticking to its current roadmap. Um, and I, I, You know, I could see a world where the TGC could say, are we going to coordinate everything? But I don't think so. I don't think that'll happen. That doesn't really make any sense to do so. Um, but then how but, do but you... But they're really... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but then how do you... How it is checked that the things go on the proper direction? Well, uh, the... So there is, you know, there are regular meetings, obviously, and there are, you know, there are OSRF board meetings that occur on a quarterly basis. There ah, is okay. ROSCON, critical thing, right? Okay, ROSCON, okay. we're presenting, we're trying to put actually a little bit of structure. I think uh, last year was the first one where we did a general state of ROS presentation for everybody. So make sure that we're upfront with the entire community of how things have been going. Um, obviously, there's, you know, there's regular updates to discourse as well to make sure that people are seeing like, you know, here's the latest You know, here's the latest, um, you know, humble sink or whatever. Here's what's going on. Um, and those updates are happening on it. Like, really, we're trying to move. It. The idea is to keep it as honestly as as decoupled and loose as possible. And if if there's a need for more structure, then more structure will be put in place. But I don't I don't necessarily see so see that. And like the other thing is you, you'd ask also about the budget is, you know, the, the because this is the same legal entity, the budget is reviewed fundamentally by the board and management that is uh, Vanessa and, and Jeff have authority to work with that budget. So there's actually nothing that says that, you know, <laughs> Vanessa and Jeff do not have rules. Like the board has not put in rules that says, Oh, you need to work out that like you need to set out your budget spend. Like if you don't spend it by March, you don't get to spend it for the rest of the year. There's no rules like that. Okay. Um, okay, okay. There's a lot of there. Again, we're trying to maintain flexibility where we don't need the structure and add structure where structure is needed. And right now I we see, see a, a good need for structure in terms of the, you know, the, the, how the projects actually execute. But in, in terms of some of the other points, we're not going to, we're not going to add anything unless it's, it's required. Okay. Okay. Great. E excellent. Then I, I got it. That one. Then uh, let me see. Um, so let me see some questions because we are jumping from one place to another and See, oh yeah. So, what happened right now with the current technical committees and special interest groups? Are they going to disappear? Uh, yeah. So the we've uh, actually just I, I actually asked some of these detailed questions on how we're doing this here. So there there was the you know the ROS 2 TSC is being folded into like the Ross PMC broadly. That's simplification, but that's roughly what's happening. It's being folded together. Um, some of the, and then now that the Ross TS, Ross 2 um, TSC had working groups itself. Some of those are going to be working groups under the Ross PMC would because, and what that means is that they are specifically related to Ross. Some of them are going to be special interest groups, which go up to the TGC. And for anyone watching this, there is actually like uh, FAQs and various things like that. But basically, the, the ROS2, everything that ROS2 TSC is doing is being is being distributed. Um, and then there are there is also this other concept called community working groups. Those were actually never really run by the OSRF or the TSC. So we're going to just like 
tweak the naming and say those are we're going to refer to those as community groups going forward, just so there's no confusion between you know, uh, working groups or special interest groups. But generally, like, this is the idea is like, we have a lot of great people who are working on Ross and Gazebo and everything. We're not looking to change that. We're just looking to, you know, to to just put a little bit more structure so everybody understands what's going on. Okay, okay. Then uh, I will, I will try I will draw a, a graphic with all those relations and where it goes. So I will put it with an image also here. Yeah, so I, people I think, should be, oh, yeah. I'm just, I'm just checking the website here. If you go to, yes. you go to there's a link, uh, yeah. osralliance.org slash how it works. So if you, if you go there, there's, a, there's this whole actual uh, chart. Yeah. yeah, it should appear let's, here. Let's look up there. Of here. So at the, uh, when you watch the, the podcast, you can see the image here. And also I will put the link on the, on the video f to that specific uh, chart that describes this. Then uh, let me see uh, other questions. Then, uh, yeah, so I think that we have covered uh, all the questions from now. But, well, I have a final question. So what is going yes. to happen to the Sense, Think, and Act podcast? Uh, we're, we're looking at plans for that. So that's an OSRF thing. Um, we're looking at what we can do with it. Uh, but, but as we talked about earlier, the OSRF like as a whole, we're, we're, we're um, entirely focused on the Alliance right now. So uh, I, I would just say stay tuned on all of your, all the usual channels. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, because the, 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 um, the host... Um, Audrey Huthrow, then he, he left for his own adventures. And then in the middle of all these things, so it still hasn't been possible to restart it, right? Yeah. Obviously, the, obviously, the OSRF and Audro have a, have a great relationship. I think, I, I don't know if it was Tully or Brian. Someone was on, or Jeff, maybe, I can't remember. Someone was recently on his new podcast talking about a very similar topic. So, um, so I, But uh, I think there's there's a lot of space for more discussions around Ross and open robotics in general. Okay. Um, okay. Yes. Like for example, this podcast also exactly. the Ross Developers Podcast. <laughs> yes. You were okay. here first. <laughs> yes, and then okay. No, no, now the really final question. So, uh, where can the audience find more information and send you questions? Not to you specifically, but to the whole alliance. And so I don't want there, them to flow you with the question. Of, there are all sorts of wife. ways. So. Yeah, there are all sorts of ways. Um, obviously, like the OSR Alliance uh, website, as well as Ross Discourse, those are the, the high level of conversations, but I'll send you... Uh, I'll, I'll send you some links and you can put them like here, there, there or, or on the show on notes. On yeah, the show exactly. Notes. Yeah. So okay. there's, there's a number of different channels to get in touch with people um, online and, and we'll, I'll send those links out. Okay. Excellent. Then uh, that's all that I have here. I think I have understood the structure. I need to see that graphically in order to get it into my mind, but I have understood the, the first, the reasons why this was necessary This is very important. And second, what is going to provide to the development of ROS? And third, how it is the organization itself. So for me, that those points are like the main points required for the community. And I think that we have answered those questions in the, in the podcast. So thank you very much, Brian. Uh, Ryan. No, sorry. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And if, if I may, I'd also like to thank everyone who's, who's tuning into the ROS Developers Podcast, likely because they're ROS developers or would like to be for for all of the, the enthusiasm and, and contributions you've either made or, or will be making to the community. It, it really is, uh, it really is exciting. And I'm looking forward to what the next, uh, the next 14 years of my Ross involvement are going to be. Excellent. We'll be also there. <laughs> <Of> course. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Okay, and that is all for today. So thank you very much for listening to this podcast. And remember that we'll have another lesson from the expert next week. And until then, just keep pushing your Ross learning. <laughs>